The 1960s. You know them, you love them, you may have lived through them. We had the Vietnam War, which some people liked and some people didn't like. We had the Civil Rights Movement, we had Stonewall. With the chill of the Cold War still in our spines, we had the assassination of JFK and MLK by, it looks like they misspelled US government, but it's just a typo. We had the Beatles, the Beach Boys, uh, Jimi Hendrix, um, Credence, and Steppenwolf were filling people's radios, and protests of all sorts filling, filling the streets. Despite it being a tumultuous time for the people of America, across the seas it was a tumultuous time for a much different reason. One that would turn those in power to consuming the flesh of their peoples in great feast halls, as children slaughtered their teachers and police boiled people alive all in the name of their great leader. So the year is 1958. Mao Zedong is the current president of the People's Republic of China, and after about eight years of service, he decided that they needed what's known as the Great Leap Forward, which consisted of forcing people into farming communes all across the country. However, this leap forward ended up resulting in economic catastrophe and statewide terror, and eventually cannibalism that is the worst to have been seen in the 20th century. There are many places where things went wrong, but to start, Mao ordered all sparrows in, in the country to be killed because he believed that they were eating too much grain, which was impacting the amount of food that was being produced. However, the sparrows also fed on locusts, so with the sparrows' populations being declined by mass numbers, locust populations went through the roof, and they absolutely destroyed majority of the crops and harvest in the areas. As many as 38 million people starved to death in the famine that followed this incident, which is approximately 450 times the amount of people that died in the bombing of Nagasaki. This is regarded as the gateway for the atrocities that happened at Guangxi. What happened during this famine was the start of the removal of morals. It became a regular occurrence for people to eat their dead, for mobs to run the streets and kill who they could because they wanted to consume flesh while it was still warm. There are cases of men digging up their wives or past family members and consuming their flesh. Parents have been written to have eaten their children at the time. And this was out of starvation. This was out of desperation. These people felt that they had nowhere else to go, and with millions of people dying around them, some chose to, as a method of survival, do what they could. However, when you have a large majority of people who were brought to such a point where they either were forced to eat their loved ones, or were the type of people who willingly murdered and ate people, and then the authorities at the time do not do anything about it or do not condemn it and instead say that the worst offense is standing up against them. Revolutionaries were painted as the true evil in this situation. If you went against Mao Zedong, you were considered an enemy and an enemy to the state and therefore an enemy to everyone else. So the people who survived this instance are now going forward in a society in which propaganda is postered everywhere in which what they did is not the truest evil, and thus it's not a far stretch to assume that that would have consequences later on, which it ended up doing. In May of 1966, only a few years after the fam, Mao Zedong launched what is known as the Cultural Revolution, which is essentially the mass removal of those who Mao considered an enemy. Anyone who spoke against communism, anyone who spoke against him, was deemed an enemy to the state. Now while this resulted in as I will later explain, massacres all over the country, one in particular took place in Gangxi. So in Guangxi, when this was proposed, uh, two factions formed over time, over a small amount of time. One was dubbed the United Headquarters, and they were in utmost support of Wei Goshin, who at the time was the head chairman of Guangxi, as well as a high-ranking CCP official. And this United Headquarters group, or faction, was in full support of purging the revolutionaries from the area. While the other faction that formed was against Wei and was asking him to sort of self-reflect because they obviously viewed this as an extreme uh, response to what was considered their own people. However, violent struggles very quickly broke out between these two particular factions in Guangxi. Propaganda already being extremely widely spread throughout the country um, only increased from here. They were putting propaganda that was all about Mao, Mao Zedong, 
and all about how he is the greatest leader that will ever come to this country, and during his time, proposed the violent subjugation of those who stood against the CCP, or Mao Zedong, proposing that they be met with violence from either officials or citizens. People who were arrested for this re reason were paraded around towns wearing dunce caps or signs with what they did wrong before they were slaughtered. Methods of killing during this massacre as proposed by officials were as follows. Beheading, beating, stoning, live burial, drowning, boiling, group slaughters, disemboweling, digging out hearts, livers, genitalia, and slicing off flesh, blowing up people with dynamite, and more. In one particular case, according to an official who saw it, saw a man who had dynamite strapped to his back with a crowd around him cheering as he was blown to pieces. And it was roughly at this time when cannibalism truly began. However, at this time, it was not due to a famine. When it began, it was due to a sense of a power struggle. It was deemed as the ultimate way to subjugate your enemies is to not only kill them, but to consume their flesh. There is a terrible case of a geography professor named Wu Shufang who was beaten to death by her student at a Wuhan middle school. Her body was reportedly carried to the flat stones of the Quan River, where another teacher at gunpoint was forced to rip out her heart and her liver, to which the middle school students took her organs, brought them back to the school, cooked them, and ate them. At the time, it was not unusual for things called flesh banquets to happen, which was if there was someone of a high enough political dissonance or importance, they would be killed and prepared and feasted on by high officials. It wasn't like someone being beaten in the streets and people stripping off the flesh in order to eat them before they got to a table. This, this was a person who was brought in somewhere, killed and prepared like a proper meal and put on a table and people gorged themselves on them. There would also be people who would hoard bodies, cut up their flesh, and give them in large bundles or chunks to people to take home. According to Yan Le Bin, a member of the public security who joined the investigation of this entire thing after the massacre, in 1968, 38 people in Wuhan County were eaten and 113 officials of the county participated in eating human flesh, hearts, and livers. Chen Guorong, a peasant from Guvang County who happened to pass by Wuhan, was caught and killed by local militia because he was fat. His heart and liver was taken out while his flesh was distributed to 20 people. A female militia leader ate six human livers in total and cut the genitals of five men and soaked them in alcohols, which she would drink later, claiming that these organs were beneficial for her health. The behavior of eating human flesh, hearts, and livers occurred in many counties of Gangxi, including Wuhan, Wuming, Shaanxi, Guagang, Guizhou, Guoping, and Lingyang. After the Revolutionary Committee was established in Shaanxi County, a killing conference was held at Pingxiang Square on September 1, 1968, during which more than 10 officials and civilians were beaten to death. After the conference, a committee member, Li Hao, removed the hearts and livers from the corpses, sautéing them and preparing them as dishes for other representatives who attended the conference. According to Song Yoji, a Chinese historian who works at the California State University in LA, Independent researchers in Guangxi counted a total of 421 people who were eaten. There were reports of cannibalism across 27 counties in Guangxi, and that's two-thirds of all the counties in Guangxi. There was one man who said to be in the so-called fifth category, who was beaten to death where he stood. He had two kids, one 11 and one 14. The local officials and armed militia said that it was too important to eradicate such people, so they not only killed those two children, they ate them too. This took place in Puebi County, Gongxi. There were 35 people who were killed and eaten in total. Most of them were rich landowners and their families. There was one landowner called Lao Zhejiang, whose entire family was wiped out. He had a 17-year-old daughter, Lao Zhelin, who was gang-raped by nine people for 19 times, who then ripped open her belly, ate her liver, and breasts. There were so many incidences like this. And according to Frank de Cotter, Chair Professor of Humanities at the University of Hong Kong, Throughout 1967, but also 68, there are factions in the countryside that start not just eliminating each other physically, but literally. In a couple of small towns, they start ritualistically eating each other. In other words, it's not just enough to eliminate your class enemy, you have to eat his heart. So there are very well-documented cases of ritualistic cannibalism. There was a hierarchy in the consumption of class enemies. Leaders feasted on the heart and liver mixed with pork, while ordinary villagers were only allowed to peck at the victim's arms and thighs. The motive for cannibalism that took place, as stated by Ding Zhulang, a professor at the University of British Columbia and at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. 
This was not cannibalism because of economic difficulties, like during famine. It was not caused by economic reasons, it was caused by political events, political hatred, political ideologies, and political rituals. Quinn He showed the statistics that the cannibalism was not caused by traditional or, like, ethnic beliefs, but instead an extreme amount of classism, thus leading to the extreme massacre of the lower class by the upper class, fueled by the revenge from local officials and military to the rebels who challenged their beliefs. Song Yong Ji also lends to the action of um, past beliefs where it was believed that consuming someone's organs could allow you to live a longer life. Even though no one really openly practiced this, it's understood that if that is sort of a myth or something that is uh, at least people have heard of, when they are committing such atrocious acts, they may begin to believe that. Add all of this together with the pressure of communism having an overall rule that removes all form of freedom from the people not only freedom of action, but freedom of thought, which results in those in power being able to have full and complete control over what their citizens openly think or say. Similar instances from the Kuomintang, which is essentially the Chinese secret police, uh, have been shown where they, the police and the military encourage cannibalism as the ultimate way to lay waste to your enemies. Relying on the information from interviews and secret documents that have been smuggled out of China, Chinese writer Zheng Yi reported that the Red Guards and officials in the area of Guangxi ate the flesh of some hundred victims that they had tortured to death. Chinese scholar named Lu Zhejiang reported in Public Affairs that the Red Guards in Jiangxi ate the people of those that they killed, quote, as a way to demonstrate their feelings about class frustrations, end quote. One of former Gangxi Red Guard, who participated in, an, in a cannibalism incident, told Zhang, the, the writer, quote, What I killed was the enemy. Didn't Chairman Mao teach us if we don't kill them, they'll kill us? Fang Jikai, author of 100 People's 10 Years, described a man who led a Red Guard attack on a student who defeated him in a political debate. Quote, his faction trapped the guy and cut out his tongue with scissors. And then said that the man he interviewed was the man who removed the other man's tongue, and he is reportedly now haunted by the image of scissors. One man told writer Paul Thoreau about the railroad known as Death Rail. Quote, During the Cultural Revolution, people used to kill themselves on this section of the track. One person a day, and sometimes more, jumped in front of the train. In those days, the buildings in Beijing weren't very tall. You couldn't kill yourself by jumping out of a window of a bungalow, so they chose the train because they were too poor to buy poison. Tristan Shaw wrote in List Verse, to cleanse the class ranks of counter-revolutionaries and capitalists, the Communist Party operated revolutionary committees nationwide to root out its perceived enemies. From 1968 till 1971, the committees launched a campaign of terror across the country. One area especially hit hard was the Inner Mongolia, where the alleged secret Mongolian separatist party was said to be carrying out counter-revolutionary activities. Hundreds of thousands of people, mostly Mongolians, were arrested, maimed, and tortured. Another 22,900 people were killed. Other provinces such as Haibel and Zhejiang also experienced huge purges. As a part of the crackdown on the alleged Kumatang spy written, 84,000 people were arrested on Haibei. Over 2,900 suspects are recorded to having died from injuries they received from being tortured. In Yunnan, as estimated by the province's cleansing the class ranks office, almost 7,000 people suffered from, quote, death from enforced suicide, unquote. So while people think this only took place in Gangxi, and it is more well-known in Gangxi, this took place all over the country. And reports of cannibalism also took place all over the country, however, this was the most condensed that we at least know of. At the end of all of this, in June 1981, 20 years after the events that took place, an investigation concluded that the total death toll was a minimum of 100,000 people. However, private citizens and officials claim it was anywhere upwards of 500,000 people. However, according to public official documents, only eight people died and 37 people were injured. However, classified documents that show the true death toll, as said before, have been smuggled out of the country by those who fled the country. The author Zhang, this is a quote from him, 
Nowadays, government control of the media and public opinion is tightening. It's absolutely clear that to establish their own authority, they control the public opinion. No official commemorations of the anniversary are expected. As usual, the Communist Party fears bringing up the atrocities that they have done because it will hurt their so-called public image. The more you talk about such things, the more the current CCP leaders are worried. Because the government has never permitted a deep examination of its history, it's impossible to say the lessons they have learned. So to this day, they do not acknowledge that this happened, nor do they acknowledge the many more massacres that took place after it and many more that took place before. Nor do we most likely know about many of the instances that happen. For instance, Tiananmen Square, which I'm going to be making a video about, is a completely censored topic. The only thing that the CCP has said about it is that it was a successful quelling of a small protest, when in reality it was the massacre of hundreds of thousands of people. They refuse to acknowledge their true history in any way, shape, or form because it makes them look poorer than they are. It reveals how bloody and horrific the leadership has been. And this instance isn't taught about in schools, neither is Tiananmen Square. The only reason people know about it is because of people who fled the country and gave us this information and have been able to show us what is actually happening. The only reason Tiananmen Square has so much visual evidence like photos and papers and whatnot is because there was journalists from across the world present in that area. So they couldn't, they tried, but they couldn't shut up what they did. So at the end of this, what is often known as a scary story of yet again cannibalism, I wanted to show the difference between cannibalism out of desperation and cannibalism due to a steady decrease in what morals people hold and how a government like this, a government that Mao Zedong held, and the current president, Xi Jinping, is doing the same thing. And most likely, many leaders after him will. Hopefully, we can pray that someday things will change. But for now, this is what's happened, and this is what we know. However, they're never going to talk about it. And the Chinese citizens and, and people who have lived during these times have been faced with some of the hardest atrocities that people have to go through. And whether that be Tiananmen Square, whether that be this massacre, whether it be the next, there are people who will one day be freed, and they will one day be able to tell their lives and their stories completely uncensored. And we can only hope for that day. And until then, do what you can to spread information, do what you can to provide resources for those who are not able to, so it's not China, but there is an organization called Flash Drives for Freedom, which helps bring outside information into North Korea. North Korea is an entirely other story, but I guarantee you, we do not know surface-level incidences that happen within that country. So, for instance, something like this. There are programs throughout the world in which we can try and get information into fully censored and controlled populations, or get information that is in there out to the rest of the world so that we can possibly change what is going on and prevent this from happening in the future. This was a bit of a dark one, um, but I did not know the depths of this until I went into it. Um, and I wanted to make a video that is the truth, that is the facts of what's of what's going on. And and always remember that despite these these stories, despite these atrocities that happen in every country throughout the entire world, there is no country that is free from censorship. Um, I don't know if we will ever hit a day where it is, but if we do, that would be quite exciting. Um, however, always remember that there are people who go through this and are working their hardest every single day to be able to change things. No amount of evil in the world will ever stop the amount of good that persists forwards. Continuously throughout history, evil, if it has one, has only one temporarily. There has always been revolutionaries, there is always going to, people, going to be people who stand up against those that are doing wrong, and that is something that I don't think will ever change, because that is hardwired into who we are as people. So uh, I want to thank everyone who's watching this, everyone listening to me rambling. Um, it's currently raining outside and I have the window open and the fan on, so you can probably hear that, which I apologize for, but I hope this was educational. Um, I'm going to be doing more, more videos in the future. Obviously, if you have 
any anything you want me to cover, leave it in the comments. I will happily do so. If any of you are like, hey, I don't know what happened on this day, or, or people often talk about this, what does this mean? I will happily go into it. Um, and I'll do other content. It doesn't have to be about history. It could be about a conspiracy theory, because for instance, uh, it's still publicly believed that JFK was not killed by the CIA, which is complete garbage. Um, and yet, that is still publicly perpetrated. That is that is still told, and I would consider that complete propaganda um, to make one's country look better. Uh, so I should probably stop talking before a red dot slowly finds its way onto my head from the window <laughs> that I'm sitting in front of. Um, but I hope you all have a good day. Uh, leave a like or a dislike. I know YouTube removed the dislike button, but um, I can still see it, so I'll know if you liked or disliked this video. I swallowed a bug. die on camera <coughs> it's the fbi they got me cia whatever i wish you all uh, a good day and i'll see you in the next video bye